Do you ever think about what it is that makes you happy? It could be someone you love, who loves you, the things you do, the places you see, the work you do. It's hard to pin it down and it will be different for every individual. After many months of anticipation, I'm heading up to get this new wheelchair. Um, this is going to completely change my life. This new chair will now allow me to go on beaches, forest trails, places I can't normally access in my ordinary wheelchair. For the last couple of days, I think really it's been a case of going over in my mind all the adventures that I'm going to embark on and different places that I'm going to visit with this new chair. And that's why, you know, go to bed and the, the cogs start turning. <laughs> I just have not been able to sleep. Just been purely like a little kid at Christmas. So, yeah. So, well, let's get it unwrapped. Been on the charge for you, so it should be ready to rock once we get it undone. Amazing. So I'll pop this over here. I have osteogenesis imperfecta. It's a soft tissue connective disorder, so it can literally affect anything. The most common symptom is brittle bones. I remember being out in the playground, for instance, when I was in primary school. Someone bumped into me, and next thing, that's me, I've broken my femur. It, it was just horrific. The rehab really couldn't catch up with the amount of fractures that I was having. I've counted about 100. <clears throat> Around the age of six, I had um, you know, a number of bad breaks and that really was the time that I started to use the chair full time. Let's go a little bit further forward, maybe six, okay. seven feet. And let's lean a wee bit forward, get a wee bit of speed on. Good. Yeah, that's good. Think about that line stopping. Yep. It's incredible, really amazing. I just can't wait now to get out and, and use it. I'm back, 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 back. Yep, good. <laughs> I can't stop smiling. <laughs> when well, I watch all my friends going for hikes, taking walks up the Mourne Mountains makes me long to have an element of this in my life. Just to be able to experience nature and the world around me will make such a difference. Saying that, I've been lucky as I've lived a lot. I've DJed in Ibiza supporting Judge Jules. I've run a number of successful businesses. I'm a camera operator and an aspiring filmmaker and have recently gained my commercial drone license. The drone gives me a sense of freedom, allowing me to escape and briefly forget that I'm in a wheelchair. It gives me a sense of joy, but the truth is that my life to date hasn't really provided me with the happiness I'd hoped for. We all deserve to be happy, so what I'm trying to figure out in making this film is whether it's possible when you have a condition like mine to truly ever be happy. But what is happiness and can any of us ever really achieve it? There is a huge mismatch, I think, between what people think will make them happy and between what has been shown empirically to make people happy. We've had about two and a half thousand years of ethical discourse about what happiness is. We're not going to answer it in the next two and a half seconds, but I argue that happiness is about pleasure and purpose. It's about finding things that you find fun, but also having activities and experiences that you find fulfilling. If you look at someone in a wheelchair, you think that person in a wheelchair is paying attention to being in the wheelchair. And of course, if they were all of the time, they would be as miserable as we would imagine them to be. There are things that from the outside look so debilitating that you think, I would never want to live like this. Harriet Johnson, who's a disability activist in the US, she had a, some congenital spine deformation and she was in a wheelchair. She says that she would be waiting for the light to change on the street corner, and people would come up to her and say, if I had to live like you, I'd kill myself.
So the disability paradox refers to this strange sort of human psychological phenomenon where you expect people who suffer from significant illness or disability to have a much lower level of well-being than healthy or able-bodied counterparts. That doesn't come true in, in real life. I'm not sure, based on my own life experiences, that the disability paradox holds any truth for me. You know, late 20s, um, I started to think more about my disability. You know, people are getting married, settling down, having kids. The reality that I wasn't sort of progressing or keeping up with that societal norm was, um, you know, it, it really hit home. And that's when I started to have, you know, these sort of feelings of, of depression. Rightly or wrongly, this is something that I have attributed to my disability. No one knows this better than my mum, Nuala. Christopher, you know, he had such an outward going personality and that's why I feel it's so sad now that he can't use that personality as much. He didn't ever accept that he was disabled. And when we tried in the early years and he did go to some of the groups with disabled people, but he never really felt part of it, which was strange. Christopher was happier being with able-bodied people. Um, that was a very interesting point because it, it is very true in this whole thing of acceptance of disability. I didn't, as a small child, look at myself as being disabled. So, the big question for me is whether happiness and disability are mutually exclusive. Javi Carell and Paul Dolan have spent years trying to find the secrets of happiness. Maybe they can help me find the answer. What is this thing that we call happiness? Stoic philosophers, for example, thought that the absence of suffering is a wonderful achievement. So all you really need to do is remove all the things that impede you in the, in the moment in order to be happy. I was told my condition would improve after puberty. I had always sort of visualised that I, at one stage, would be able to walk again. Other points of view, especially, and I think this fits in more with the kind of modern way of thinking, think that you have to have not just the absence of negative things, but also a lot of positive things. So a lot of money to be youthful, to be uh, regarded as physically attractive by other people. But then there's the internal things, people's ability to have an internal sense of self-value, that they matter in the world, people's connections with other people, friendship. You know, when I was a, a very small child, I looked normal, and it wasn't until the, the deformities with my condition started to really uh, become more apparent that you know, I, I um, had a lot of issues. I don't know if I agree with the Stoic philosophers who say that if you remove the impediment, you will find happiness. I don't have the luxury to choose whether or not to use my wheelchair, but I can see how the idea of how you see yourself can impact on how happy you feel. That really resonates with me. I try every day to fill my life with positive things, but it's a constant battle when, for example, you don't feel confident in how you look or your financial stability. I suppose the challenge in making this film is how can I ever know if I would be any happier if I wasn't disabled? Paradox suggests disabled people are much happier than non-disabled people give them credit for. I'm not sure that I agree with this, so I'm on my way to meet actress and disabled activist Samantha Rank to see if she's as happy as the paradox suggests. And let's have a look over in this corner because I think they've got a lot of jewelry and I've already spotted something that I really like. Tiffany's. Is it? No. <laughs> oh, I got excited then. <laughs> Get ourselves organised. Right. Like yourself, I have brittle bone disease, and we've had, I guess, very similar paths in terms of our upbringing and the things that happened to us. Tell us a bit more about your experience with um, our condition, which is, you yeah. can pronounce it for Os everyone? Osteogenesis imperfecta. Still can't spell it. Um, it's funny you say disease. I actually call it condition. 
because of disease. I think it's got the quite negative yep. connotation. And also, you know, um, you could probably catch other things off me, but you won't be able to catch <laughs> bristle bones from me. Tell me about your, your quality of life. People looking at disabled people think that you're miserable. It's pretty darn good. Not to sound cliche, but I am actually living my dream. I did exactly what I set out to do, and I don't think many people can necessarily say that. You'd never guess who I had in the back. <laughs> You'd never guess. That, that's Samantha Rank. That's what? who you had. That's Samantha. That's right, there you go. Yeah. They see me on telly and smashing it at life. Like, doing really well, like, makes good money, um, you know, is doing really well in her career, you know, does red carpets, has celebrity friends, yet the same people that see me still will p pat me on the head and go, oh, bless you. So I don't know how to get people to make that connection. Sure. Uh, I think it needs to be society that needs to change a little bit more. When we're kids, like, um, we don't necessarily know that we've got a condition where we won't be able to, to walk. But I was carried around on a pillow when I was a baby because I was breaking um, at least two or three times uh, a week. But a lot of OI kids do get to that 18 months or two years when you start to try and sure. pull yourself up. It, it's just natural for the parents to want them to mm. walk, you know, and we obviously know from the experiences that we've had and the trauma that just walking is just not... It's the, not going to be right. The path to go down, it's not right for us. No, it's you know? not right. I mean, I don't know about you, but I've had a number of operations. I've had my tendons cut, extremely painful operations, and that was purely to get me up and walking. They would have just said, you know what? Let's make her world a little bit better by uh, accepting her wheelchair and seeing that as a positive thing rather than a negative thing. And I think what you, you know, there's, there's a term, it's the medical model of, of disability. And I always say the first words that my parents heard were, I'm so sorry, it looks like there's something wrong with the baby. We've taken her to a different hospital. Pray for her, because she'll probably die. But wouldn't it be great if, congratulations, you've got a baby daughter, what are you gonna call her? I think we need to change the narrative um, when we talk about disability right from the word go. Like Samantha, I've also struggled my whole life to change the narrative for society to accept me for who I am. The medical model of, of, um, of disability or, or, or of, of illness measures, it's a sort of deficit model. So it measures what you can't do. If you have a progressive illness and you're just measured by this deficit and every time you go they say, oh, your lungs or your kidneys are worse and worse and worse, then of course that could be a very kind of negative message. What is really important, I think, is to, to keep this focus on your life as a whole. So meaningful relationships or moments of happiness or well-being. I think in, in medicine the picture is largely negative because their job is to focus on these deficits and try and treat them as best they can. But the deficit is not everything there is to say about a particular person. So, so individual people's life circumstances and attitudes are really crucial here. And they're not necessarily being measured when you measure somebody's lung function or, or kidney function. If you're born with a disability, you don't have that adaptation process. There's nothing to get used to because that's how it's always been. But what will matter for someone who's born with any condition, someone who's born poor, someone who's born tall, someone who's born short, someone who's born rich, or, you know, whatever, is that you will seek to maximise your happiness given the conditions and circumstances of your experiences. Brian Galt is one of the estimated 9,000 so-called thalidomide babies born around the world in the early 60s. Okay, there. The drug thalidomide was used to treat morning sickness but resulted in defects at birth. As a result of Brian's mum using it, Brian's childhood was filled with years of pain and struggle as society tried to fix him. Do you know why the day they talk about these driverless cars where you don't touch the steering wheel? I've been doing it for 42 years. I just checked in my shirts. To 
defying my expectations, just as he's done all his life, Brian drove himself here today to meet me. Minus 30. Hi, folks. Hello, Good. Chris. Come on in. Hello, Hi, Chris. nice to meet you. Good morning. Come in. All right. It's great to see you. There's a lovely home right. you have. That's great. Nice to meet you. How are you? And great. you too. Fantastic. Great. How are great you, Brian? All right. And you too. Hi, mate. Hey, lovely How to are meet you. Chris. Nice to thanks meet you. Thanks for having All right. Us. No, thanks for coming. In. Brian, can I get you to sit sit here then? And um, I'm just going to get things set up. <laughs> okay. So, thinking back when you were a child, when did you first realise that you had a disability? One of them was certainly starting to use my toes. You know, whereas my big brother Alan and my sister Patricia were using their hands, I was lifting up my toes up onto the kitchen table. My mum and dad would put, a, I've got a, a, a pen here, pretend that's a, a spoon or a fork. And you know, mum and dad would put that in between my toes. And I had to try to lift that up to my mouth. And uh, there, there I am when I was two and three months old. And when I was that age, I was told that I was going to get my arms. And I thought I was going to get real arms, like my big brother and big sister. Okay. And mum and dad took me over to Scotland, to a hospital. And uh, that wasn't easy because they left me at the hospital. I didn't see them again for another 10 weeks. I had those emotions of, yeah. you know, mum and dad, they didn't love me anymore. But over the next three weeks, so I was told, the engineers at the hospital made my first pair of arms. And you know, Chris, when I saw those first pair of arms, my wee heart was down. That's maybe one of the earliest ones that they put onto my wee shoulders. My goodness. Those arms were alien. They weren't part of who I am. I'm Brian. You know, just accept me who I am. The boy with no arms. And that pressure that was put on upon the parents to try to, to get us looking like, in quotes, nor normal looking. The professors insisted my parents get me to wear them for eight hours a day. And my shoulders would be coming out and all these blisters and wheels and cuts and bruises. The amount of effort that I had to put in to try to get those arms, even just to feed myself. It could take an hour to have something that I could do with my toes in 10 minutes. Those arms actually drained me. It wasn't easy. But my 13th year, I would call that a turning year in my life. One day, the teacher came into my classroom and said, Brian, the professors in Scotland have all come to a collective decision that you don't have to wear those contraptions, those metal arms anymore. I said, yes, yippee. So now I can show them what I could do with these toes and 10 times quicker than those old metal contraptions. Brian was able to free himself from his metal arms. Unfortunately, escaping the wheelchair imposed on me by my condition has never been an option. The wheelchair was really never any issue other than how other people perceived it. We were different. And anybody with a child with a disability will tell you, people treat you differently. Up until Christopher was quite an age, people would still have been talking to me instead of Christopher about him. You know, which I find unbelievable and very patronizing. You know, isn't he great? It was heartbreaking. You saw his contemporaries come and see Christopher and say, right, I'm away now to play football, I'm away to do... And Christopher would sort of go, right. He was a very happy child, given all of the problems that he had. I noticed the change when he went to grammar school. There was bullying. And Christopher did not tell us, but it was his way of coping. He needed friends. And I think in some respects, he let people bully him for want of a better word, in the hope that in the end of it all, he still would be 
included in the group. Um, so there was, um, you know, na name calling because of my um, disability, because of, yeah, the way I looked. It's, it's, what can you do? You know, you're not exactly going to get into a schoolyard and knock the crap out of that guy and try and uh, stand up to him. I mean, it happens, dealt with it, move on. There were worse things that were happening to me back then in terms of, you know, the fractures and bits and pieces. But, um, yeah, the, um, it, was, it was just, it was just crap. It was just, uh, it was just really, um, bad time and you know mentally definitely you know I, I um, it was probably one of the worst periods that I went through um, just because I was so unhappy and that was really my first proper experience of being very very unhappy with my life. The bullying really made me focus on having a disability, something I was trying to block out. I just wanted to be accepted, to feel the same as everyone else. But I was different. I was disabled. And they made me feel that was a terrible thing. Would a girl ever look at a man with no arms? Just going down the street, you know, with someone with, with no arms and people would be staring at me. You know, I had come to accept myself and I was longing that someone else accept me just for who I am. I've got love in me that I want to love someone else. I asked God to give me dreams, to give me a lovely wife, May, and we've been married 20 years now. And the lovely thing, God you also knew that I needed a companion and a helpmate. Relationships are something that I've always struggled with and largely due to the fact that I have so many body issues. Certainly it was a number of years ago was the last time he had a girlfriend. It, it didn't last, uh, but if he hadn't got such body dysmorphia issues, I think that might have made a big difference. I was doing things to mask my body image. The jeans that I wear have baggier legs to try and mask the fact that you know, I've got really small skinny legs or hoodies to try and cover up my chest. There are people in this world that obviously can accept those things um, and they can deal with them in different ways. I just, you know, I can't. And it's through a lack of acceptance of my disability that's really, I continue to have that problem because you're always thinking about it. There's lots and lots of techniques in this area called positive psychology. So. Um, for example, if you ask people to think about three things they are grateful for in their life um, once a week, that makes people happy because you because you you know you think oh actually oh, I'm really grateful for this and that and you think about those things you bring them to your mind and that's a that's a great exercise. Mindfulness practice, meditation, you name it. There's there's so many concrete steps people can take to to improve their level of well-being. I'd admit I have a tendency to focus on the negatives when I think about my disability. I wonder has that coloured the way I view other disabled people? If I was asked, would Christopher um, want to be involved with somebody who had a similar or different disability, what would I say? And I would say categorically no that Christopher, not that he would have anything against anybody, but he has always, always preferred to mix with people who are, you know, have no disability and he would consider himself amongst them. I haven't gone out of my way to avoid dating someone else with a disability, but it's not something I've actively pursued. 
Samantha is outspoken when it comes to dating and disability. I'm very vocal on it because I think sometimes people within the disability community, they feel a sh- the shame about saying, I struggle with dating. When I vocalise that, I do get a bit of pushback from the disability community going, I've never had a problem with dating. I'm like, are you sure about that? Really? Are you really sure? And this is, I find that really kind of bizarre because um, there's no shame in saying that people are prejudiced when it comes to dating. Because we all, we all are to a certain degree. We've all got our types. Um, I remember about four years ago, I went to a dating agency and I had a very honest and open conversation with them about the fact that I was in a wheelchair and that most of her clients would be looking for the typical tall, dark and handsome. And the girl who ran this agency agreed and basically said she couldn't help me. I mean, it was just it was a bit of disbelief. You know, because you're disabled, have to go on a program like the Undateables. Is that, is that the, um, the pigeonhole that, that you're meant for? Um, I don't believe it is. I remember one online dating site. I was on there. I had about 200 people interested within the space of 24 hours because I scrub up all right on a headshot. And then I whittled that down to about six people that I started talking to. And then I disclosed my disability and all of them, some of them were very rude. First of all, you know, would you be able to have sex? I get a lot like, can you have kids then? What would my parents think if I brought someone home in a wheelchair? These are conversations that people are having with you online before you've even met them? Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I've lost count of times the first question has been, how can you, how do you have sex then? But I've also, you know, had some very scary experiences where I've been targeted by men that find children attractive. Um, that's been horrendous for me and that's really put me off dating. You know, this kind of sinister side of um, of, of being a petite and, and woman. And of course then the, the natural thing then is to go and look at other disabled people. In school, like in year nine, so about 13, a boy started at my school and he sometimes used a chair. So, uh, and I remember all the kids going, hey up, Sam, there's one for you. And that annoyed me. And then I was like, no, I will never date anyone with a disability because that's what society wants me to do. Then I started meeting lots of disabled people and there was a couple of people who uh, had brittle bones that I was like, oh hey, I wouldn't mind uh, um, spending a a soiree with you. So yeah, it's it's an interesting one, you know, it will, it will happen if it happens. Um, but I do think that I am hell-bent on, I don't want a carer, I want a partner. Stafford and Jean Lynn are married and are both wheelchair users. They have what's termed an acquired disability. Stafford was 29 when he was injured in a motorbike accident and Jean experienced a spinal injury at the age of 17. One of the, the challenges for anyone with a disability is um, finding love or being in a relationship. How have you both handled that and found that? The fact that we're in wheelchairs, that's not why we're together. Yeah. It's just a benefit and you know, it's just one of those things. You know, If we'd have met in, in life as able-bodied people, we would have probably had the same attraction to each other because we really liked each other as friends and we're both full of fun. I, I hate stealing one of Jean's lines, but she's one of the first disabled people she ever met was herself. You know, and you don't understand disability until you actually acquire a disability. I was sort of looking under the fact, look, I am not dead and I'll be able to function in some sort of way. That happened and I moved on. You, you had to move on, you know, you've got a family. I had a family at the time um, with young kids and stuff. Um, so, you know, I had to be able to sort of look after them. It's still my job, whether in a wheelchair or whether or not in a wheelchair. Living with a disability isn't an easy thing. <clears throat> It's like a, a roller coaster. Oh yeah. Because I feel like our highs are really high and our lows are really low. Um, but it's just part of our world. I don't think I had a, ever had a time that I didn't cope, but it was definitely different and there was definitely times where things were harder than maybe if I hadn't been a wheelchair user. Sometimes I have a lot of stress going on in my life, but it never really, you know, it never really impacts that much that I'm going, flip me, I can't cope with this, this is just too much. I think the big secret is not to let it define you. Our ability to adapt is really phenomenal. 
this idea of adaptation, which is a, which is a well-known psychological phenomenon, or more specifically, hedonic adaptation, just means the way in which we get used to stuff around us. So, so the really interesting thing here is that you find that when people get a diagnosis of a life-limiting or life-changing condition, that's going to hit you quite hard. But within a year, pe people really regain their, their previous level of well-being. Um, but after that, people are not less happy than they were prior to becoming ill. As much as Stafford and Jean talk about not letting their disability define them, mine has in many ways defined who I am, impacting my mental health, resulting in bouts of depression. There's a huge sense of frustration and then that, that brings on those sort of feelings of depression because it's just this overwhelming feeling of hopelessness. But thankfully my depression, at times challenging and often debilitating, does come and go. Today I'm shot to bits but I can actually pick up the camera and talk to you whereas the majority of times when I'm in a really bad state picking up anything is just such a a huge struggle and I'm just literally lying there not able to do a thing I don't even pick up the TV controller I don't want to talk to anyone in particular I mean if a phone call comes in I want to just uh, knock it in silent because I just don't have the energy or the willpower to, to talk uh, so that's that's just been the way it has been over the last sort of 10 years now My, uh, my head is not in a great place right now. And, um, you know, I just have a tendency to sort of uh, head for the drink at times like this. So, picked up a, a bottle on the way home and I'm gonna be getting stuck into that now. Despite the fact that it's um, five to two in the afternoon. And I'm absolutely exhausted. Um, really didn't sleep last night. So, yeah. Hopefully tomorrow will be a better day. Was there ever a time that things got blue for you? Yes. When I was 10, going on 11. When I thought, is it worth going on with my life? Everybody was saying, Brian, this is how it has to be. There's no other avenue, there's no other way. And I thought there is another way out of all this. You know, if I just got, you know, just got, you know, killed myself. But thankfully, I, uh, I came through it. How have you dealt with that in later life? I get comfort from God as I read the scriptures and I sing, and also being with other Christians and on, you know, going to church on a Sunday. Do you know at school, there were 40 boarders, residential school. And do you know it was compulsory on Sunday mornings to go to church or go to chapel. And do you know, I have to be honest here this morning. Do you know I used to pretend or feign that I was sick come Sunday mornings. Do you know, I was never sick on Saturday night because much of the day was on the football. Through Brian's resilience, can-do attitude, and a strong faith, he found a way to live with these early challenges. You can have constraints that you didn't choose, you can have a body that you didn't choose, but you can still make a rich and satisfying life out of that body. For me, for my work, has always been that it's not that it doesn't matter that you're ill or disabled, it's that you can work with that and that it's really important to keep pointing out the positive aspects of a, an ill or disabled person's life. Dermot Devlin has also managed to achieve a positive outlook as anyone who follows his antics on social media will appreciate. Mm -hmm. 
Dermot has a rare metabolic disorder called mucopolysaccharides Morkew disease, which affects the skeletal structure and respiratory system. He has championed disability access issues, setting up a charity called My Way Access NI. It's like anything else, you know, you, you get the cards, you're, you're dealt with and you just play them, and you get used to it over time, and it, it just becomes a part of your life. And is that sort of respiratory issues you've had, is that more of a recent thing, or has that been something you've experienced growing up? It was something that was always there, but about uh, 30, when I turned 30, I went to Lourdes, when I was coming home on the plane, I collapsed. Most people go to Lourdes for the cure, but I come back worse. <laughs> from looking at some of the stuff that you've been involved in, all that sort of Comic-Con stuff. Would it be fair to say that that is a great distraction? As soon as I went there, I just loved it. But it's also to show other people as well that just because I'm a disability, it doesn't mean that it's something that people should be walking in hell cells around me. I go, yes, I have a disability. I'd rather you ask me a question about it than stand there gawking with your mouth open. Like myself, Dermot also craves companionship in his life. I would find that I would be lonely town, especially in certain situations, like Valentine's just passed, that kind of reminds you of dear. And then, you know, when you go to weddings with it, family or friends, that kind of reminds you that you're still single. Or a friend or family would have children, maybe like a newborn baby, stuff like that, that reminds you that potentially you're not going to. But I do have like a great support network of friends. Like just because you don't have that one aspect of uh, sh human interaction in your life, you know, you do have a lot more out there as well. Like you've got friendship, you've got family. I, I've thought about this personally a lot. I mean, f for me, I know that I really don't want to have children, for instance, because I don't want to pass on my condition to anyone else. And anyway, I know a lot of people with osteogenesis will not like to hear that. Um, and, and they'll have very different viewpoints and I completely respect that. Like, I mean, if I ever was lucky enough to meet somebody, I am getting a bit old now, as I wanted to have children, like I, I wouldn't have an issue with that there. But I totally understand you're coming from yourself. Like, I mean, you know, because I'm not over, over it to the ins and outs of, of your disability, but, you know, you might have different reasons to why why you want to, wouldn't want a potential child to have it than what I would have. I don't actually know whether I want to have kids because I genuinely want to have kids or whether that is because I need to prove a point to other people. Like even my mum, when I moved to London, I, I didn't, I, it, it happened very quickly. And I said to my mum, you need to sit down. I've got some big news. And she grabbed her chest and she went, oh my God, please don't say you're pregnant. I know my mum doesn't want me to have children because she worries about physically giving birth. She worries about will I be able to cope and that's really sad for me, you know. I want to be able to give my mum a, 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 a grandchild. I've often wondered would having a child and building a family have made me any happier? Stafford and Jean have recently become parents. I'm interested to hear about their experience. When, obviously, you guys uh, took the decision to have a start a family yourselves, what sort of emotions were involved in making that call and how you were sort of finding that issue of obviously you guys being in a wheelchair and raising a, a baby? Um, I suppose it was uh, quite an emotional emotional thing to embark on. It was going to be a, quite a, a gruelling process to go through to have a baby. We were going to need to go through IVF and we ended up needing to go through it twice. So that was quite an emotional thing that we went through and yeah. it was it was hard but we did it. And now we're so lucky because we have the most amazing little boy. And um, that brings all sorts of um, challenges, having a toddler and having two parents in a wheelchair. Oh, yummy. Is that really good? When I go to a place, I have to do a risk assessment. I need to make sure I know where the exits are. I need to make sure that the doors are closed. And I need to make sure I can get to stop my toddler running out the door. People really do mean well, but there's a fear there because they don't feel prepared 
to know the language to use, how to speak to people. Sometimes when you're out in a supermarket and someone's like, oh, you know, I can't believe you're out doing your shopping. And it's because they don't actually compute that you live a, a life very similar to what other people do. I need to get my shopping in so that I can cook dinner. Um, so I've got a very rare progressive lung disease called LAM, L-A-M. It's got a longer name, but... Um, and <clears throat> it affects only women during their childbearing years. So the lungs develop cysts and they become less and less functional over time. After my yoga class, I used to go to this fruit and veg shop and buy fruit and veg and go home. And I never came with my children because I've always, I came after yoga. <clears throat> then one time I came with my son and the woman behind the counter just, she, she hugged me and she looked so happy and she said, you've got a family, I'm so, you know, I didn't know you had a son. And I remember thinking, she's obviously made up a, a whole story in her head about how, because I'm disabled, I'm also single and childless and unhappy and all that other stuff that wasn't true at all. So that's kind of an example for how, you know, the only thing we can really do is ask people how they want to be treated, how they want to be addressed, what they need, what would help them the most, what kind of support would be the most beneficial for them, and not make assumptions. I was recently doing a show and one of the other panellists kind of tilted their head and went, oh, do you live alone? Do you live on your own? Because she, she assumed that I would never be able to live independently. There is definitely this um, disability perception gap. So non-disabled people definitely think there's been a shift because they start to see more people like me on the telly. Um, but actually, the reality is disabled people feel, still feel discriminated against, still face prejudice on a daily basis. I think the louder we shout, the more pushback we get because we were then people who lived at home with parents, who never spoke up, who were to be pitied. But it was like, oh, bless them. But now we're like, no, don't bless me. Um, you know, don't want to change me. Don't think I can be cured by going to church. I, I am me and there's nothing to be ashamed of. Every day, Sam and I have to find so many ways to negotiate the world and live independent lives. And yet all people see is our limitations. It's time for society to catch up and engage with disability in a meaningful way. Every family should know and live with a disability somewhere, know somebody with it, to see how normal it is, how tragic it is, how funny it is, how, but not to turn away from it, not to be afraid of it. Yes, yeah, so ultimately I think that's um, uh, the essence of the disability paradox. That people haven't been exposed to disability, they have these assumptions and these uh, mindsets that have been developed through just society in general and through a lack of understanding and awareness. And they really haven't had that intimate contact um, with disability to truly understand it. Right, a little bit more on the lips. There we go. Perfect. Is it? My work here is done. <laughs> Don't hate me. Tell me about your own experiences within this sort of media landscape. I think you've got the fact that disability doesn't scream beauty. Like, I'm never going to go on Love Island, am I? But I suppose not many people will get on Love Island. And I did uh, get quite a lot of abuse after um, a, a big commercial that I did. To see the hatred, to see the... Um, disgust people had for disability shocked me. I second guess whether this career was for me. I became very self-aware of, of how I looked. Should I feel ashamed of who I am, you know? Um, I suppose it made me question, you know, will I ever, will I ever then get married if people are feeling so horrible towards disability, you know? It yeah. really so made me not, question. knocking your confidence. It knocked my confidence um, a lot. Thankfully, I haven't experienced the same level of abuse that Samantha has, but it's clear that something needs to change. There have been um, assumptions made of people uh, with 
disabilities that they're not capable of fulfilling a role, for instance. And it's a big fear that I have because I know with the fatigue that I have has impacted my um, ability to hold down a, a full-time job. It has always been about trying to carve a path for myself with some form of self-employment. And a lot of the time that hasn't worked. You know, it is more challenging if you have a disability. You will always feel that you have a point to prove to others. I've always looked to better myself and prove that I can overcome whatever life throws at me. Something my mum knows all too well. He has a restlessness, for want of a better word, um, which is again, I think, tied into his condition of not being able to physically run out and do things. So his mind is shooting off in a million different directions. It's a really cliched thing to say, and I'm sort of hating myself saying this, but it's about the journey, not the destination, right? So if you're constantly looking for the next thing. If only I get to there, I'll be happy. Well, you're never experiencing any happiness along the way. And so they, we, we do seem to sometimes get caught in this trap of kind of constantly pursuing more and more and more. And it becomes like an addiction, right? You just can't say, if I get to there, I'm gonna be happy. Well, you could enjoy where you are now. So we need to sort of chill out a little bit and sort of enjoy the ride as well as where we might finally end up. What Paul is saying rings true for all of us, but it really resonated with me as I thought my new wheelchair would solve many of my own issues. I knew that it was going to bring me happiness, freedom, everything else. And then when I got it, you know, I realised the things then that I, because I, I knew that it was going to allow me to do so many more things, to get out, and, and I'm loving it, don't get me wrong, yeah. but, but there is a caveat to it that, um, you know, it's bringing me a lot of anxiety because I've had things go wrong with it, you know, having broken bone disease, um, if I have a, an accident thing, it's game over sort of thing, so um, it hasn't, you know, that, that uh, ideal sort of vision of happiness that I had when I started, um, it hasn't sort of translated as I had sort of expected. I'm still not sure if there's a blueprint for happiness, but all of the amazing people that I've met in this film accept themselves for who they are. Yes, they may struggle at times and continue to do so, but they've not let their disabilities limit their potential for happiness in perhaps the ways that I have. But what I want to know is do they prove the disability paradox? Are they truly happy? People want to hear about the man with no arms, but how he's overcome and how he's accepted. And obviously for me, with my faith, knowing that one day that uh, I will have my arms. The Bible says that, that when I see Jesus, I will be like him. And I actually thank God for my disability. Can you say that you're genuinely happy at the moment? Life is pretty darn good. A lot of people ask if you were to be reborn, would you be able to, would you want to walk? I said, hell to the no. I'm enjoying life. So when you hear people saying that, you know, you're, just, you're, you're disabled, you must be unhappy. Like, I don't know where they, they're getting this notion from. I actually couldn't be happier. If I had a genie in a lamp and someone offered me to not have a disability, I don't think I would pick that. This is, this is my life, this is my path, and it's awesome. And I do awesome things. Yeah. And we have an awesome have, life together. We, we have an awesome life. And what do you think the, the secret has been? A lot of it comes back to expectations. So as soon as I had my accident, the, the one thing that shook me to my core was that I didn't have to fill the dishwasher anymore. And that's when I realized nobody had expectations for you anymore, that you could do nothing. And I think that has driven me to prove that actually I can do a lot of things. Confronting difficulty and adversity in your life has the potential to make you more resilient and more thoughtful um, and to give you a certain kind of wisdom that arises from particular life experiences. <clears throat> to say that it's a good trade-off, I wouldn't say that at all. But I think often people talk about the kind of, and I've, I've written on this idea that illness can be edifying, that we view it from the outside as just this monolithically evil, terrible disaster. But actually within that, there's so much nuance. And once, <clears throat> you know, the, <clears throat> the dust settles after the diagnosis, most people f forge a way forwards with, with, with 
whatever other things and, and tools and tools of resilience they, they have in their own life. So it's, it's very, I think we have to be very cautious when we generalize. And of course, when we meet people briefly or see people on the street, all we're going on is, 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 our, is our general attitudes towards, you know, people who wear pink t-shirts or, or people who are in a wheelchair or, or whatever. And I think we have to caution ourselves time and again that we shouldn't make assumptions. Hi guys, so it's um, Thursday morning, it's half ten and uh, I'm just actually on my way up to the hospital here because uh, last night I was getting chest pains um, in the middle of the night, about half two. Um, I sort of lasted for about 20, 30 minutes and then um, was able to get back over to sleep. But I phoned the doc this morning and he's just uh, off the phone to me telling me that he wanted phone nine minutes for me. He has looked at the worst case scenario for osteogenesis and there are some horrific um, medical things that can go wrong. The spine, the internal organs, everything is um, getting worse. The state of the bones, as they said, they're like tissue paper and he is facing that, and it must frighten him. And please God, he will get older, his condition will maybe stabilize. Um, I will worry, and Michael and I will worry until the day we die. Because I've been sort of proactive in connecting with other people with my condition, you see at the very worst end what it's doing. So, you know, we've got um, a friend, friend of mine in the States who's got basilar invagination, which is basically uh, a direct result of the condition where the, the bones in the neck have started to collapse and the spinal column has been protruding into the brain. Ultimately, in the majority of cases, it's terminal. Um, so that, that's a big fear. I know you've had, you know, some complications over the last number of months in particular. You now have a full, you might resuscitate, you might intubate order sign because the brain stem can stop you from breathing at any time, taking time bomb in my brain basically. How have you been feeling since this has all come about? I mean, how has your mental health been? So at baseline, I would say I'm not really depressed, but I would say pessimistic is the more proper way to put it. I feel like at baseline, it's a given that people with disabilities are going to have more bad days than people who do not have disabilities just because of our symptoms. But no, uh, I would definitely not say that everybody with a disability is unhappy. Um, I feel like I'm doing relatively well, considering all things considered. You know, I make sure yeah. I work out every day and I try to interact with people as much as possible and just try and, you know, just live my life. I think denying the reality of our disabilities and trying to say, oh, it doesn't define me, it doesn't have anything negative to hold me back. I honestly think that's a, co a counterproductive mindset. I say my disability well, certainly does define me, uh, but it does not limit uh, yeah. entirely. And sure, particularly for you, with everything that you've got got going on with the brainstem injury and those things you talk about, um, you know, it, it's just that I guess uncertainty that that um, you've just got to live every day to its fullest, um, as best as you can. Yeah, absolutely. Hunter and the other people I've met are a reminder to me of what could happen with some of the more severe complications surrounding my condition. However, no matter how low I sometimes feel and the daily struggles that I have, the fatigue and the bouts of depression, making this film has reminded me that I still truly believe that life is worth living, worth fighting for. There is this concept that people could look at disabled individuals with the view to, that they would probably be better off dead than having a disability. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious because look it's at that. Extreme, it's, it? I think it's extreme. Flip, it's extreme. Yeah. Twenty-two years I've been disabled and I've had like I, I can honestly say that all twenty-two years have been happy. I would not change it. And you know what? I might have actually have had a heart attack by now if I hadn't become disabled. I was smoking 60 cigarettes a day, working 60, 70 hours, lots of stress, 17, 18 stone, overweight. So probably would have had a heart attack and possibly being dead by now, you know, and I wouldn't have lived the life that I have. And I genuinely think I've become a 
better person because they value stuff differently. I'm glad I didn't die. I know that a lot of people can look at me and wonder, and they've even said to me, God, you know, I would want to kill myself if I were like you. Um, and, and, and that kind of blows my mind because my quality of life is is by anyone's standards extremely high. Like my disability or my brittle bones, this is just the norm for me. Now I would be a liar to say that I don't have my down days, but actually um, most of my troubles come from men and money, money issues. I can tell you, I'm happy to be alive. Uh, as I'm 40 now and I'd like to get another, at least another 40 years and start living more. So. For both people, for these people out there, Michael, you better off dead. I'm just going, I'm sorry, but I'm still going to keep living. People say glibly that they'd be better off dead if things happened to them. Maybe they don't actually really mean that. They're trying to signal something about their attitude towards that condition, about how awful they would imagine it to be if they were to experience it. Not literally that they'd rather be dead. It's just a way of us being able to say that we think this is really bad. Some conditions, you know, do start bad and stay bad. I think if you experience an attention-seeking condition, some of the mental health conditions that constantly draw attention to themselves, um, if you're in extreme pain that's unexplained, that becomes attention-seeking, stays attention-seeking, is bad for you. If we were really thinking about happiness as a metric that we would use to guide policy, we would be investing much more resource in mental health conditions. I don't think we do have a full and complete answer to the question, what is what is happiness? And I think the jury's still out in the sense that different people have different conceptions and it might be that we don't even need to try and find one single definition and that actually having plurality of ways for people to be happy is, is great because there's a plurality of different people out there um, who experience life very differently. You know, when I started making this film, I set out to find out if happiness and disability were mutually exclusive. And whilst I knew I wasn't guaranteed to find out an absolute answer, I have learned a huge amount from the amazing people that I've spoken to. There's a theme certainly that I, I, I seem to have found, and that is one of distractions. Everyone that I've um, chatted to has, um, you know, something going on in their life that is maybe a great career, a hobby or interest they're passionate about, or a family or relationship. And yes, okay, whilst I have a lot of those things going on in my life too, it really takes for you to be active in pursuing those. And it's not always easy because living with a disability is tough. It's about balancing that though. And I think this is you know another point that ties into this and that's accepting um, the disability that I have and the, the limitations that I have as well as acknowledging the positives in my life. And I'm not gonna stop um, setting goals for myself. So I think whether you're living with a disability or not, there, there are definitely lessons for all of us here um, as to how to um, live a better and more fulfilled life. <laughs>